Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning into our After Dinner Mint series titled Behind the Code. On the show, we welcome ArtBlocks artists to share a deeper look into their project's creative coding and process. Today, we welcome Darian Brito, who joins us to speak about his project paths. At the end of the show, we'll open the floor to questions that have been asked on the live YouTube page or Discord. I'll turn it over to you, Darian. Yes, hello, hello. Thank you for the invite. Very happy to be here to talk about paths. I chose to talk about paths because I already did a pretty extensive um, article about pigments, so I thought this would be something new to share. What I tried to do here is I'm going to try to make it accessible to everybody. So that means uh, coders, the public in general, collectors, everybody. It's, go it's going to be a step-by-step -step, um, mm -hmm. explanation, so you can follow all the implementation from scratch. So it's going to start very simple and adding little blocks on top of it. So that means it's going to be very incremental. And I hope it makes sense even if you never heard of or wrote a shader before. So, OK, let's start with that with that first question. So what is a shader? That is the that is how path is made. So a shader is a little program that runs on the GPU. That is your graphics card or your graphical processing unit. And on code that is written for the CPU, it runs uh, in parallel. So the CPU runs serially, but the GPU runs in parallel. So I'm going to show you now what do I mean by that. If you see this little image here, I hope it's visible. The black blocks mean a process. So that's a little machine performing some computation. And in a serial way, each machine has a certain time that it takes to, to do the process. So it, it, there are 10 tasks, and each task takes one minute. It will take 10 minutes, because it's one by one in series. However, in a parallel way, you have instead that it, each machine just does its own time uh, on its own, and the whole task takes basically one minute because all of them do it at the same time. So that is the difference. And as you can imagine, it's a massive gain in speed. OK, so now let me show you an example of how a serial program looks like. Uh, here on the left, I have a noise uh, that is just a series of gray scale values. And those gray scale values, I want to transform them somehow. <clears throat> so here in the code, is is written in Python, this code. Uh, I'm going to take the data that is coming from this texture, and I'm going to, that's step number one. Then I'm going to go over every pixel in this data, and every pixel, that means five items, because there's five pixels here. And I'm going to scale one of them at uh, every step by a 50% factor. So that takes five steps. And then final step is to put that out in some new texture, and then you have the result. So that is a serial approach, because it's a series of steps one after the other. However, there's another way I could write this, which is a parallel program using a shader. In this parallel program, the difference is that there is no steps. It's just one single call, so one step, because you can imagine that each pixel is its own machine, and all of them perform the computation at once. So in here, it's just all running in parallel. Maybe it's not so clear first how this works or why it works, but that's what I'm trying to demystify in this presentation. So let's let's uh, keep on going. All right. Here, I am showing you how um, a texture looks like when you map the coordinates of the texture. Because working with shaders, you don't have anything defined for you. You basically have to define everything from scratch. That includes the shapes, like a circle, like a line. They are not like in programming languages like processing or, or something like JavaScript that have some primitives with libraries and so on. We don't have that in GLSL. So all you have is really the coordinates of the space you're dealing with. And that is really everything you need. So let's talk about that a little bit. Here, what I'm plotting is basically for each pixel, I am showing its coordinate on the texture. And that is uh, simple to understand if you remember from your lessons on the number line, things have two axes, right, x and y. So if we see this, I think they are too small to see on the screen, and maybe not, but I hope you can see. Here you have some values that appear. And you have something that says u and v, and that is this uv that you see in the code. Those are the values for the coordinates, but they are expressed in values from 0 to 1. So that means that the bottom left, this texture, will be 0, 0. So 0 for x is 0 for y. And the top right will be 1, 1. 
Another way to say the same information is with zero to resolution. So this is a 10 by 10 grid. That means that this will be zero, zero, the bottom left, and the top right will be 99 because we're counting from zero. And yet another way will be, for example, to transform the space to be instead of from zero to one or from zero to resolution, to be in the real from negative one to positive one. And now you see how this is uh, being drawn differently. If now I see the pixels from the center left, they have now a negative address, and from the center right, a positive address. So this is just like a basic uh, XY coordinate system. And this is the kind of space that I'm going to use to draw everything in paths. All right, so here I can introduce this concept that there is a signed space that is based on these UV coordinates, which are really just the coordinates of, the, of each pixel. All right, so now I want to show you how can I draw things with this thing without using explicitly a primitive, like a circle? So while in some programming languages, you can just say ellipse or circle, and it draws it in a shader, that there's not such a thing. So we have to think how to do this from scratch. And let's think, for example, how to do it with a circle. Maybe you remember from high school that you can draw a circle using this formula. R squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. That gives you the radius squared, right? And if you uh, simplify this, if you evaluate it, you can say that the radius of a, of a circle is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. And that is just uh, the Pythagoras theorem in disguise, right? So I think most people are familiar with this the Pythagoras theorem. And that's what we use in this shader to draw this circle. As you can see, that's what I'm applying here. Let me just evaluate this line here first. That is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And this space is, like I said before, from minus one to one. So I'm just really using the negative one to plus one coordinates in this shader, like I explained, and doing this operation to get the radius of a circle. That is what this SDF holds. And what is an SDF? An SDF is, it stands for a sine distance function. And why is it called sine distance function? Is because it has basically two signs. And it acquires two signs when I define uh, an offset for this SDF. That's what I'm going to do here. This point 5 is going to define how big my circle is. If I evaluate this, you see that the, the circular thing that was before becomes a hard circle here or a harder circle here and smooth out black color. So what is happening is that everything from this edge inside the circle is negative and everything outside the circle is positive and therefore is a signed uh, distance function. It gives us a negative distance when it's inside and a positive distance when it's outside. And that is the trick we're going to use to draw everything in paths. Now furthermore I can um, define limits for this so that it draws more more accurately the circle. For example, I could say that if the SDF is higher than 0.5, then I'm going to make it 1. Otherwise, I'm going to make it 0. And then I get a hard circle like this. And I can do the same using a better function <coughs> defining GLSL, which is this programming language I'm using, called step. It's just the same as this thing here. OK. Finally, we can also uh, decide to do something a little bit better, which is, if you notice, this is rigged on the edges, so it's hard pixels. I can also decide that I want to interpolate them using this. And now these uh, rigged edges have disappeared. And this interpolation is something I'm going to use a lot also in paths. So I hope this makes some sense, um, at least enough sense that you more or less understand how we can make shapes with just the coordinates of the pixels. OK, so now let me go to the core, core engine of paths, which is a rain marcher. I'm going to try to demystify a rain marcher. I don't know how successful I will be, but I hope this, this will be a success. So let me try. A rain marcher is actually something very, very simple. It's just um, defining a point in space. That can be any point you want. And then taking little steps over time to find out 
what objects are the closest in the scene. So I here programmed a 2D uh, ray marcher, and you can see this little object here, this little dot, that is the position from where I am gonna march my steps. And all these other shapes are defined with SDFs. Here you see, for example, the circle I just explained, also a segment, which is just this kind of line, a line, which is this, and an SD box, that is a box with an SDF function. And this is by the master Inigo Quiles. Okay, so here is a box, here is a sphere, and here is the ray marching algorithm, which is this part. Before I dive into the algorithm, let me move this around so you intuitively gain an understanding. If I change the angle of view from this position, look at what happens when the ray intersects some, some place. So you see that the circles, they become uh, less or more depending on what I hit. So if I'm changing the angles, then based on this ray, you see how it takes the steps. So each of these circles is a step to search what object in the space is close to the view of this point, this yellow point. If I change the position of this yellow point, you see also how that affects what the, the, the rain marcher sees. And this is how I can, without really knowing anything else about the space, how I can tell if I hit something. And that is the core of a rain march. So now let's look at the code. The code is very simple. First, I need to define some depth from the point I am here. We start with zero because that's exactly at the center of this point. So there's no depth. Then I define a number of steps to take that I want to do to search for something close. Then I define a minimum distance. Remember that because these are SDFs, sign distance functions, Everything that is inside the distance is negative and everything outside is positive. So anything below this value will be considered a hit. Like for example, this hit here, yeah? And then a maximum depth, because what happens if I don't hit <coughs> anything? For example, like in this case, it just goes the ray to infinity. So it doesn't hit anything. I need to escape that so I don't waste resources. And that's all there is to it. Basically, I start at the origin then I find the direction I'm looking at. In this case, it's this angle. That's the direction. And then I multiply by some depth. So I start with zero. So this will be at zero the first time. Then I see my world, which is comprised of these objects. I see what, the, what is the current distance. And then I check if it's negative or if it's smaller than the minimum distance, or if it's larger than this, then I escape. And I keep track of the distance um, by adding it to my depth. And then I use the total depth computed to see if there is a hit or not. OK, so the main part to focus in this code is this. That's the Ray Marcher algorithm. And that is the essence of everything I do with paths. And also other projects in blocks that use the same principle of Ray Marching. All right. That being said, now let's see it in 3D because it's actually a bit harder to read it in 2D than in 3D. So let's go now to a to a 3D world. OK, so here I'm drawing a sphere. It doesn't look like a sphere. It looks like a circle. But believe me, in, in practice, it is a sphere. Only problem is I don't have light information. But OK, bear with me for a second. Let's first define a sphere in three dimensions. So what is a sphere? It's just a circle with an extra dimension. So we just add z squared to our equation for the, for the circle that we had before. And then we just have the radius of a sphere. And that is what I'm doing here. So if you see the formula is exactly the same, exactly the same as we had for my circle here. This is the circle. And this is the sphere. It's exactly the same. OK. And this is the radius I'm giving to the sphere. So if I change it, it becomes smaller, a little bit bigger. And now I hope you have some intuition why this works. I hope I explain it well. <laughs> and then this is the world where we're going to compute everything in it. But before we add more objects to the scene, I want to explain how in 3D we have implemented a ray marcher. And the ray marcher is right here. It's just this, very, very simple. Like before, I said you have the depth, you have a position, you take steps over time to see what you hit. And when you hit something, 
So when you touch something that is very close to the minimum distance that we define, then you consider that a hit and you can color things. So if I change this to be, for example, red, then that's what it, it gets colored. And it's a sphere, but like I said, we don't have information about the light. So that's why it doesn't look like a sphere. And the code, like you see, is really simple. There's nothing really mysterious or worth explaining here because I think it's pretty clear. The camera is just a position space, X, Y, Z position. And the direction is just finding where am I looking at from the camera? And that's all there is to it in this code. Now, let me add the concept of uh, normals, which is how we're going to try to define some light. If you see here, all the code is exactly the same as before. I have just defined the function get normal. What is a normal? Uh, the intuitive understanding to have is that a normal is a little arrow. We're going to call that a vector. It's an arrow that always points perpendicular to the surface that you're using. In the case of a sphere, it's always going to point perpendicular to wherever it is in the surface. So it's going to be from the ground. It's going to be straight arrow up in this case. In the case of a sphere, depending on the angle of the curvature, but it's always perpendicular to the surface. Why do we need that? Well, we need it because it is very useful for us to calculate how light bounces in the sphere. And uh, yeah, to get a normal, we need to deal with derivatives. That's a little bit from calculus. If you're not familiar with calculus, that sounds a bit scary. But we're going to take not the derivatives analytically, so not precisely the derivatives, but we're going to use something called a gradient, which is an approximation of those derivatives. And the way you can think of it is simply as say, setting a tiny offset for each axis of a point in the world, in this case, of a point in the sphere, a little bit offset to the left, a little bit offset to the right, a little bit offset up and down, front and back, and uh, subtracting those vectors so that you get automatically the vector that is the normal, the points perpendicular to the sphere. And it's little, a little bit of a trick, but it works very well for most cases. The only problem is that it's not an exact thing, so you have to be a bit careful with it. And also it's expensive because if you see here, I need to calculate my whole world six times. There are ways to speed that up, but for the purpose of this presentation, I just want it to be very clear, so I'm going to do it not optimized for now. Okay, I said a lot of things, maybe it doesn't make sense, but the key takeaway from this is that the normals will help me to calculate lights. They are these vectors that I spoke about, and now we see a little bit more the notion of a sphere because I'm coloring the sphere now with those normals. And if you see it, if you think about what I said, it really makes sense because you see on the right of the sphere, things are more red. And that is because that tends to be 100 zero, zero for the uh, RGB values. So that will be more red. The ones on the app will be more green because that is 0, 1, 0. And the ones in the front will be more blue because that is 0, 0, 1. So then I know this computation is correct because it gives me this, this view, this uh, normal view. Okay. Now, let's see how I can compute light based on those normals. Here you see the sphere much more clearly. But if you see the code, it's really the same. Nothing really changed. It's all the same thing, except for this little part, which is the get diffuse. I'm going to call this uh, diffuse. is just a way to say how much light uh, should be diffused from the sphere, so how much light is getting into the sphere. And to calculate this, I need only two things. One is the direction from the light source to the position, to the point position in the sphere. And I define that here, that is the light position, and P will be the position on the sphere. And then I am simply using uh, something called the dot product. The dot product is one of those things that is super useful for many, many uh, applications, especially dealing with shaders. What it does is basically this that you see here. If you have two vectors, uh, the dot product takes the x and y components, in this case of this 2D vector, multiplies and adds them. That's what the dot product does. If you want to gain a more geometrical intuition of what they do, you can think of it like this. You can think of that the dot product gives you a 1 when the vectors tend to be in the same direction, a negative 1 when they're in opposite directions, a 0 when they're perpendicular, 
And in that way, you can tell more or less uh, how close or how far apart they are from each other. And yet one more thing that you can think of when dealing with the dot product is that it gives you an angle. And that is when the vectors that you're using have um, a length of one. So you can then discard the factors of the magnitudes and you can consider the dot product equivalent to the cosine of some angle. So you actually can use the dot product to find an angle. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so as you see, the end result of this equation is quite simple. Just the direction where I'm looking at, that diffuse factor. And in the code, I am simply coloring now that sphere with the light contribution that I get from the, from the computation of this diffuse. So, okay, now let me take a little pause and say that if you didn't notice, we're pretty much just uh, from scratch defining our camera, our lightnings, our, our object. So we're really building a little rendering engine that is similar to, for example, what you do when you work with Cinema 4D or what you work with, um, I don't know, the program, like, I don't know, whatever that uses camera and geometry. We're doing exactly the same, but we're doing it all purely with mathematics in a pixel shader. Okay, so that is what this ray marching process is about. Okay, now let's move to a more complete, um, a more complete lightning model which is this Fong, Fong uh, model. The Fong model is exactly the same as before, but we add one extra thing, which is the specular component. And the specular is just the reflective aspect of, um, of the light. So if you see this little, little white spot here, that is the reflective component, and that is computed with this. So what is happening here? I'm going to try to be brief. I'm uh, not going to go too deep into it, but what is happening here, I'm just computing this. It's from Wikipedia. You can go and read more in detail. We have a light source, that is L. We have a normal that we already computed. We have a view, which is my camera origin. And we have an R, which is the reflection of this light vector. Using those components, I can compute this specularity, this uh, reflective property of light on the surface. Here we see an H, which I am not really using. And this is for an optimization that you can do using the half vector, but I'm not going to use the H in the paths. So uh, this is how it gets computed, a series of operations, basically calculating an angle to find how much contribution that specular element has. OK, so that is all that is sufficient to know. If you are actually trying to implement some ray matching, I suggest you to just go to Wikipedia, read this model. It's quite straightforward. Or you can just see my code, and uh, yeah, this will give you some basic Fong model. All right, all the rest in the code, as you see, exactly the same. Only difference is that when we hit something, now the color is going to be the lights that I'm computing here. And the lights, let's see if I change a little bit the position, look at what happens to my render. So if I make it to be more to the left, and maybe put this on the more lower, now more in the front, or maybe make it far away and really far away on the y-axis. You see how I, con I can control easily the light contribution for this sphere. Perfect. Now, a little thing. This is mostly for coders who want to do ray matching. Um, you always, when you work with it, we work with shaders, especially and shaders they want to render like this, you should always do gamma correction. And that is also what I do here. Gamma correction is a way to correct for the um, curve that monitors introduce because the human eye perceives brightness in different scales. So they try to optimize for how the human eye is. It's a little bit like uh, in music, when you have a higher pitch, it tends to sound louder than it actually is. Uh, and then we do a curve to prevent that. The same is with, um, with colors. So we need to bring back that curve that the monitor will introduce after we render. We need to bring it down or bring it up, actually, so that we get what we mean. Because let me explain it like this. If you don't do this and you put some input like 0 0.5 for the brightness, what you will actually get is 0 0.21. That is not what you want. You actually wanted 0.25. That is linear space. What you put in comes out. But what you get is not linear space, it's sRGB space. 
So we need to um, do this gamma correction to cancel that factor so that what you put in is really what you get out in terms of values. So that is what happens here. If you see this equation by the exponentiation rules, uh, you can cancel the exponents and then you get you end up with 0.5 to the power of one, which is really what you meant. Okay, sorry if it's a bit um, not so clear, but if you want to learn more about gamma correction, you can read it here. But it's just a factor that that corrects a curve introduced by the monitors. And it's important to do it before any colors, because if you don't do it before any colors and you do it later, all your colors, you can throw them through to the trash. So do this early in the process of compositing. Okay, so now let's go and see a more complete model with all the stuff implemented. So here you can see that I have uh, my normals, my diffuse, my specularity. I also added one extra thing, which is the Fresnel. I see the time and I don't want to go too deep into it. I, I better skip that to speak about more important things. But simply the Fresnel is just a way to um, to express how reflective a surface is, okay? Uh, you can read about it more. I will not uh, spend much time in it now. And I'm also adding here a tone mapping curve. I'm using one from Narkowitz, from this paper. Uh, it's in the public domain and it's MIT, so you can just grab it for your projects. Uh, basically, tone mapping is a curve that is applied to the colors so that it gets a little bit more of a filmic feel. They use this a lot in films when you go see a movie and you have they have filters and they have all that kind of stuff. They also do some tone mapping to, to enhance the colors. That is what I'm doing here. And this works pretty well on most uh, color spaces. So that is why it's quite a popular uh, tone mapping curve. And you do that before applying the gamma, of course. So you see tone map and then the gamma. And this creates basically the whole lightning system that I'm using in paths. That is all I'm doing in paths, nothing more fancy than that. Here's the full uh, Fong, it's called Fong Lightning model. Here I have the full uh, model and that will not change anymore. Okay, now let's see. In paths, there's many lights. So how can I add more lights to the scene? So as you can see here, I refactor a little bit the, the get Fong function. It has exactly the same computation but I have changed one single thing, which is that now I pass this light struct. So in GLSL, you can define structs. Structs are a little bit, if you're familiar with Python or JS, JS they are like a little bit like dictionaries. So you can put attributes in them or properties and you can call them. So it's a way to keep data organized, basically. So I created a struct for a light and that is defined in a get lining function that defines the lights. Here I define light one and light two. And I also define an ambient light. Let's go step by step. So the ambient light is a constant. So it's just a constant value. If you see, I change this, everything increases. And this is useful to have because nothing in reality is purely dark. There's always some light into it. So you need an ambient light. I compute the view direction, which is the camera to the position of the sphere, which we already did before. The first nail, then uh, I declare my light sources. Here you can see that uh, there's a position. So if I change my positions, now I parameterize this a little bit. So if I change the light position, you can see how that affects the render. Uh, let's change number two, there you go. Number three, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is how I control my lights. And then the color of the lights. I added a couple more properties to it, such as the power of the lights, so or the amount. So if I decrease this less contribution, more contribution, shininess and the specular strength. Then I compute the func that we saw before in the previous code, which is this, this function. And I do it twice, one for the light with these properties and then for the other one. And to add it all up, I just simply add this, their contributions. As you see, it's just addition. So it's really, really simple to add more lights. I could add 20 more lights and uh, just add them together and it will render it. So that's what makes this modeling so so flexible. Okay, so nothing, nothing more in this code than that. Uh, recapitulating, just refactor this and separate it into two functions. And here, now we enter into the 
into the core, or let's say into the more advanced things that happen in, path, uh, in paths. One of them is uh, the concept of deformations. So now we have a sphere, right? I just show you the sphere. I want to deform the sphere, so alter the way it looks like somehow. And that's what I'm gonna do with this, in this part, deformations. So what is happening here? Basically, I have my sphere like always, like in all these uh, slides or code. And what I'm doing is I am simply displacing the positions of the sphere along with some noise values. And I'm using now simplex noise. And we're not going into it because there's no time. And also because there's a lot of math involved that goes over my head. So it's quite, it's not trivial to compute it. If you want to learn how simplex noise is computed, just go here and you can learn about it. Anyways, I'm using simplex noise. Suffice to say, it's very similar to Perlin noise, but it's just more efficient. And what I'm doing is really adding that noise to the positions of this sphere. That's all that's happening. And I just added a little bit of time, time information. So I'm passing here some uh, time that is measuring how long this has been running, and I'm animating. it. And that's, that's very simple, just the noise and moving that uh, over time. And then you get this fluid motion, right? Okay, so that gives me some idea of how I can animate things in a ray marcher, and also how noise can help me to do that. But you may say, okay, that doesn't look at all like paths, and I agree. So let's get more into the shape that I actually use in paths, which are tubes. Okay, so let me show you how to make a tube. A tube is really simple. If you think about it, a tube is really a circle. And in 3D, if you do a ray marcher, if you draw a circle, the z-axis will automatically extend over time. And uh, you just need a radius to define how big the tube is. And that's what I have done here, pretty much. I got rid of the sphere, and I define a tube like this. I put the equation from before. So you remember, it's just a circle. And because I'm ray marching, including the z-axis, I'm using this 2D object in a 3D object, in a 3D space. Therefore, the three dimension automatically extends for me, so I don't even need to define it. And that gives me a tube, very simple. Let's change, for example, the radius of the tube. You can see how it becomes smaller or bigger, so big that it's now covering everything, okay? And that is the primitive I use in paths. Okay, so now let's see uh, how I can deform this further. Now look at this scene. In this scene, I can see that the tube has been given a kind of a serpentine form, like a like snake, right? And um, paths actually is called like that, the project, because I designed artificially these paths that the tube will follow. So how is that happening? It's really just this in the code. Basically, I take a cosine function and a sine function, and I apply that to the uh, positions of the tube. Pretty much like I explained I did when I uh, added the noise to that sphere. So what is this about? Uh, if you don't know what cosine and sine are, then I made a little plot of them here. You can see here um, two, two different waveforms, sine and cosine, with parameters. That is pretty much what I have here. And by changing those parameters, you can change the way those paths behave. For example, the x-axis becomes bigger and smaller, the y-axis becomes um, more frequent and so on. So that's exactly the same that happens here. If I increase the frequency of the x component, for example, look, it gets so distorted, maybe smaller distortion. So I can change really how things look like by altering the frequency of it. And if I change the frequency of the um, Y component, look how it becomes now like a worm walking like this, right? So using just those simple functions, I can pretty much design uh, these different shapes for my tube. And that is what I use to do the deformations. Okay, so let's go back to this. One extra thing that you may notice is that I have added these uh, black and white uh, elements and that is just this background here. So I'm separating the floor from the uh, sky. That's what I'm going to use later for one of the planets in the bats. All the rest remains the same. So there's nothing mysterious. 
as you can see, the main curve is just this addition of the code. Now let's go inside the tube, which is actually what I do. If we see inside the tube, then it looks like this, nothing very spectacular. And I did one minor change to be able to look inside the tube if, the tube, if you want to implement this yourself. In the ray marcher, you need to check now for the absolute distance instead of just the distance, because you're inside the object and inside everything is negative. So this will not work if you don't have this absolute here, because then inside is negative. So this function doesn't return you what you want. You actually want a positive value there so that it works as expected. That's why you get the absolute. And then you are able to go inside. And to prove it to you that I'm inside of the thingy, then I'm gonna move my camera up and you can see that that's the tube from before, but I'm just gonna go inside of it, yeah? And when I'm inside, that's how it looks like. Okay, perfect. So we're getting closer and closer to what actually, uh, how paths actually looks like. So let's add now a little bit of motion to that, um, to that scene. As you can see here, I have added some motion to the tube. So now it moves uh, left and right, it's wiggling, and uh, yeah, I need to be a bit more fast with the time. Uh, I'm just moving this along the Z axis with some uh, motion using time, pretty much like what I did with uh, the noise from before. Okay, so now let's see. I need to update as well things inside. If I go inside the tube, I need to update the lights positions. And that's what I have done here uh, below. I'm moving the light positions with the same path that I'm using to draw the SDF. So that's what I'm adding here so that the lights move as well as the SDF. And I have implemented one extra important thing, which is this get look at concept, which is uh, a way to tell my camera to keep tracing some object around the path. So it feels a little bit more cinematic. And that's what I have done here. If you wanna, you can ask me a question about it later. If there's time, I will just kick forward to not lose much time. Um, and yeah, so those are the two main changes I have done here. Just getting that look at and, um, and yeah, the, the motion and the lightning updates, yeah. So, okay, that looks already a little bit closer to how path is. But we need to, of course, add some colors beforehand. So now what if I add colors to it? Now you can see I have added some colors and the render looks a little bit more interesting. And the way I added colors is using this function right here, uh, colorize. And what colorize does is basically divides the space in a certain, with a certain factor and it interpolates with some certain smoothness. So if I change the smoothness, now you can see, I hope you can see that the values have become more solid. They are clearly patches, but I don't like that. So I'm gonna make it more smooth. And now the values become a little bit more pleasant in my opinion. And the way I'm doing it is by passing some colors and using these smooth step functions that interpolates between the colors to create that uh, variety. And that's pretty much what, it, what I do, colorize. It's just this function. And uh, the change is that now, instead of uh, using the lights as my color, I colorize first the positions of the SDF and I then multiply that by the lights and that gives me this result. Okay, that's pretty cool. Now we get closer and closer. Now let's see the deformation. Well, something changed quite drastically here from what we had before. And that is the, that I have introduced here uh, deformation concept. So the code, believe it or not, is really the same, nothing much changed, except that I'm using here in the world this definition, these two definitions of a tunnel with two tubes. I'm interpolating between the two tubes with this smin function. The smin function is a way to combine SDFs uh, smoothly. I will not explain how that works mathematically because there's someone much more qualified to do that since he's the inventor <laughs> or maybe is the exploiter of this, this equation, which is Inigo Quiles. He has a fantastic article that you should read if you want to understand this mean. It's quite simple actually. So just follow along. 
pretty cool, and allows you to combine SDFs. That's what I'm doing, combining two tubes instead of one. So um, you can see here, uh, tube here, tube, and tube, and I define two paths instead of one. One of the paths is doing the spiral, and the other path is just the straight tube. And that allows me to create this uh, distortion. And the distortion happens here, this helicoidal. I'm rotating along the z-axis, and I'm getting the absolute position of the y-axis. And that works as a mirror for the positions. And it basically copies what's up, down. Uh, it's a bit hard to explain, so I will need to go to the drawing here. If I do, if I do, for example, the absolute value of a function on this graph there, uh, absolute x, you can see that it acts like a mirror. So x and everything that happens on the left is mirror. So that's what's happening with these apps. And that's why it looks now uh, like this. Okay, that's the helicoidal. And that is all I have done to the to the scene. All the rest is the same. Nothing changed. That is the, the main core. You can have a look at it. And now I'm going to add a little bit of the noise that I uh, played with before. And the noise here, you can see, but well, not there, here. The noise appears now on the edges of this uh, cube. How does it look like here is this is the noise. I'm using uh, uh, noise functions from a very clever shaded toy person called Nimitz. Um, this is super cool because it allows me, it's very cheap to compute. I'm not using simplex because that's uh, expensive to compute. I'm using now these three noise functions by Nimitz uh, that are much cheaper and have this low poly look. And um, I'm deforming the space using that noise and I'm compositing the way it looks like pretty much by throwing things I, I there's not really any science here it's just throwing values until i get something i like because uh yeah this is pretty much based on taste so um if you change one of these values you will see that the noise becomes a little bit different but yeah it's like, like i said it's just sculpting the noise with things i i like right so no science here this is something you have to play with and the rest like i had before exactly the same only thing that changes is the formation. And one more thing that you may notice is that the field of view now has become bigger. And that is something very, very important that I wanted to explain. I think I skipped it, which is this get ray direction. Because now in this version, I can increase the field of view. So if you see, and this is something actually that paths is an attribute, uh, uh, like a property. If I decrease the field of view, or if I increase the field of view, that plays a big role in how the thing looks like. So uh, I will show you how to implement the field of view if there's time left at the end, because we're almost there. Now I want to show you the composited version of paths, paths, which is pretty much what you already saw adding noise. But what I have done here is just a lot of more um, well, uh, post-production, let's call it like that. So all the... All the things I explained are here. And the only things that I have added is, of course, I tweaked a lot with the color and I added some ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is a way to estimate that things that are close to each other, they produce some shadows, some darkness. And there are ways to compute that. I here use very cheap ways to do it. It needs to be cheap because it needs to run fast, especially on the blockchain. So I had to find ways to make it cheap. This is, these are ambient occlusion uh, functions. This one is a very cool trick. It's a hack, kind of. <laughs> it's a nice, smart trick by uh, Nimitz. And uh, yeah, the lightning model as before. And I added one dynamic light. So one light that moves on space. That is this white beam that traverses the space. But it's nothing uh, very far apart from the previous code. It's just adding a couple little thingies, like this, um, like this ambient occlusion and also a lot of uh, treatment for the colors. I do some HSV adjustments with some factors to improve the color. So that ends up being like this, the code with my rain marcher, the moving light color. And here, as you see, the colorize function, I already explained, adjusting the HSV values, 
then I multiply by light, the ambient occlusion, then the curvature to make, give it a little bit more edge. Uh, that is this darkness that is over there. So if, if I don't do this, for example, if I change this value, you see that how it becomes, the render becomes more dark. So this controls a little bit the darkness on the edge, especially. And the rest is basically some post-production, like the tomb matting and some fog and some uh, height fog. How I'm doing with time, okay. And uh, to conclude, I want to show you the final project. The final project looks like this. Uh, yes. And uh, these other terrains that I drew in the final project come from the same tube. And the only, the only difference is that when I do manipulation of those terrains, this is all pretty much by searching. Like I said, there's no science to that, but here are all the terrains defined. For example, the, this terrain, which is the asteroids, or the, no, the exoplanets, sorry, then the asteroids, then uh, you have the tunnels. And let me uh, very quickly show you different ones. So this is the exoplanet, asteroids, that will be this one. Uh, then it will be the uh, tunnels, this one, then will be carved. And then finally, the one we made, which is this helicoidal. But all of them come from the same tubes, the same technique. I showed nothing additional. Of course, the background that's additional, it's a bit hard to explain in the time we have. Um, but as you see, it's simply manipulating the tube, compositing, slicing it, stretching it, uh, adding noise to it, making things so that it looks different every time. And it's only that single primitive in the whole path. So there's not any other geometry defined, as you can see in the code. Unless I'm lying, I don't think I'm lying, let me see. Yeah, so the only thing I use is a, is a tube, pretty much. And the rest is uh, just like uh, I showed. So I showed you exactly the, the code. Of course, this one has more, more things for the final finish and for the final code, but all comes from that principle that we saw on the last code here for helicoidal type. And uh, yeah, before saying, before this ends, I want to say thanks to Shane, Kali, Inigo Kiles, David Hoskins, and Nimitz, uh, because I use some of his their functions to make this happen. All right, so that's it for the explanation. That was absolutely incredible. Um, we were just talking in chat how that was insane that it went from a circle <laughs> to <laughs> to this, um, and I mean the fact that it. That all went down in 45 minutes was uh, really impressive. Um, I think my first question is, uh, you know, I mean, I learned here that when using shaders, you have to uh, code the shapes. Um, and you said compared to processing where there's already uh, primitive primitives there for you to use. Um, and so, mm -hmm. I mean, some of these math concepts, um, you know, I've seen in high school, um, in college, um, you know, classic Pythagorean uh, theorem right there. But I'm wondering um, how many of these maybe you retained from school and how, how you went about learning the more advanced, uh, like, say, trigonometry concepts to then apply. Yeah, um, I should say when I was in high school, I was very mad, bad with math. I didn't really care for it because I was doing music. I was uh, playing the violin all the time. And I did go to the conservatory. I actually didn't go to high school in, in the normal way. I stopped on the fourth year. And then I did, I, I was kind of homeschooled with the, with the high school. So I didn't see it then. I only learned it after when I was getting interested into computer graphics. So I think the higher concepts, uh, it takes a little bit of, of understanding that it's it's simple if you practice it, you know? So I learned it quite late. I learned it uh, after I learned how to program. So it's not something I had with me naturally. It's something that I have developed because of my interest on on, uh, on this, on computer graphics. And I think anyone can do it. It's, it's just a matter of um, practicing, just doing little exercises, and especially understanding the concept, not just using things, but trying to understand how things work and why they work. I think that's that's how. 
I think that's comforting to hear uh, for myself and a lot of other folks um, that used to that, you know, math wasn't your subject uh, in school either. It's something that because you were uh, interested in, in gen art that you took it upon yourself to, to relearn. Um, yeah. I was wondering, um, you mentioned uh, kind of earlier when you went from uh, just from the sphere to then beginning the path and you, um, you know, toggled on like the noise function. I mean, the, the pattern got really crazy. And then uh, Victor here in the chat mentioned how, how fun the noise function uh, makes it oh, yeah. back. So I was wondering if you could maybe touch more on um, like the noise function, maybe, you know, broad concept, what it is, and then how, like how you go about applying it. Sure, sure. Uh, let me see, what is it? Information, I think it's this one, yeah. So the noise function, it's this one, right? Yeah. Okay, so what is happening here? The noise function is basically um, okay, let me let me explain it like this. If you have some noise like this, noise just looks like like in that way. And I'm using here simplex noise. It's the same type of noise I use in the code, but here in a node, so I think it's easier to explain. Um, as you can see, it looks um, it looks different than just random noise because randomness, it looks like this. That's just like if you see in your TV static in the old days, you had the, this kind of noise. Um, simplex noise is this other more more organic looking thing. I think it was developed by Ken Perlin for doing, he developed this type of noise for Tron. He actually did Perlin noise for Tron and then he optimized it to make the simplex noise. And what it's actually doing is just, uh, I'm using 3D noise. So in this case, uh, all the values have a random value. And as you see here, it's just uh, every pixel more or less has a, a bit of a gradient around it that makes it look more natural. And that is what the simplex noise function returns. Pretty much what you see here on the left, that is what the simplex noise is. And um, the magic is simply to displace the position. So Imagine that you have a floor, okay? You have the floor and you displace that floor with some value that is random. And you do it subtly, you, it moves it up and down. And you do it in all the axes in X, Y, and Z. And um, it's just an additive process. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that, that's pretty much what, the, what that transformation is that creates this motion. And yeah, I agree, it's quite, quite interesting that such a simple uh, displacement creates this organic looking looking thing. That's why noise is so powerful in, in generative art. And then, I mean, how, how do you go about applying it uh, to, uh, I guess this applies to most traits, but how do you um, decide, you know, what is too much noise like? Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's um, up to taste, I guess. I mean, I've seen I, see, I am a little bit more of the type of person who approximates things that are closer to reality, I would say. I like things that look a bit more realistic than things that are totally crazy. But that, of course, depends on the project. There's people who use things that's between, between uh, how do you call it, quotation marks, wrong way, that look super cool. So I don't think there's any rule for that. I mean, if I increase this, uh, let's, let's change a bit these values. So if I do this, you see what happens to the sphere. It gets completely messed up and it doesn't look correct. It doesn't look like a sphere anymore, but someone might find that interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I just do it by eye. There's, you can also do it by math if you know the, the radius of the sphere and how much proportion you want to have. But I, I have a feeling it's better to do it by intuition. And I guess my final question, like I said, when I when I first jumped in was it was really incredible that you went from a simple circle to, I mean, a an output that could you know put you in outer space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so when you were creating this from the start, I mean, like that output that we're viewing right now, is that what you were env envisioning in your mind or is it just through? Um, you know, oh. trial and error started to head you in that direction. Yeah, so the, actually the one the one I started with was the tunnel, this one. Um, 
And as you see here, it's more clear that it comes from the tube. So that's how I started. And I, at the beginning, you know, I was not really trying to do any project or anything. I was just playing around because I like to, to program sometimes. And I thought, okay, how can I make this look nice? And at some point it looked pretty, pretty interesting. I know that it's not, <laughs> it's quite funny, but uh, this one is, it doesn't, it didn't win the favor of many people because on the static images, it doesn't look so nice. You know, it looks like some weird medical, <laughs> I don't know, colonoscopy or something. <laughs> but, um, but emotion, that's the whole point, you know, emotion, it looks, yeah. I, I, I like it a lot. So uh, I started with this and then I played a lot with, with different types of noise. So I, if I move these parameters, you can also see how uh, this thing will change. Like if I move these, you see the different types of deformation. So here is closer to the what wow. I showed when mm -hmm. I was prototyping. And I started to add little levels of deformation and uh, finding things, distorting it. If I change the path, also you see the it distorts, it, it moves in different ways. So I began doing that and uh, eventually things came together. So after this one, the first one that came was this carved one, right? Mm -hmm. I use different operations, subtractive instead of additive, and suddenly the tube became caves. Then I move into the helicoidal one. because This one I designed on purpose because I like a lot spirals. Mm -hmm. And the last ones to come were, were actually the, 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 yeah, this outer space one and the asteroids, because I felt a little bit claustrophobic being underground all the time. <laughs> I thought, uh, yeah. If I'm going to make a collection or a project, it should be also outside. So I decided to make something outside, and that's how I designed this. So this one was really by design, less playing and more designing, while the underground ones were more playing. I love how you mentioned, uh, I mean, the emotional side, and and then you said being underground makes you uh, claustrophobic. That's, I mean, that's a very real human feeling and it's it's funny actually i mean that is what it invokes too i mean that the open space like that allows you to to take a deep breath yeah <laughs> yeah it's funny yeah psychologically it makes a difference awesome i mean that that was a that was a really really epic presentation um i think a lot of people are going to take great insights from it um the the chat was really really impressed as well um in, in blog talk and uh, I want to say thanks to everyone who watched live today and those who will be watching in the future. And a very special thanks to Darian for speaking on his project, Paths. Uh, Till next time, be great and happy minting. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to hear that. Hope everybody got something out of it. It was fun. And uh, happy Merry Christmas, New Year and everything. <laughs> See you soon. Awesome. Thank you.